But uh, we're going to be playing Ebenfeld Mennonite Church and upholding our win from last year. So, no, no, over at Ebenfeld, uh, what road is that on? Kansas. Kansas Road. And uh, if you if you go... Kansas and 150. Kansas and 150. There you go. See Eugene after the service. He will give you directions. But, uh, but come on out. Bring a lawn chair. Bring your ball mitt. And, uh, you know, it could be last year, probably the coolest day of summer was the day we played. We do believe last year, I think it was like June 25th or something like that. And uh, we were wrapping up in blankets. People were wrapping up in blankets. People had hoodies on. It felt really good for playing softball. So come out tonight and just plan on playing. I don't care your age. I don't, I, you know, your physical ability we will work with right so come on out that'll be a lot of fun and they i think they're planning on having watermelon for everybody and so uh just a good time 5 30 uh at evanville also you were handed a uh, paper and it says only church statement of belief and uh, this is what we have uh put together as the leadership of the church, this is our statement of belief as a church, okay? And uh, we, we tried to hit uh, the major issues, doctrines of the scripture, um, but this is it, and we've added scripture to it. And so this is, uh, this is kind of, we wanted to do this to kind of reassure everybody after our informational meeting, just exactly where we stand in our scriptural beliefs. Okay. Now, obviously, we have a lot more uh, beliefs than this. The scriptures are much more uh, uh, in-depth in their teaching, but these kind of cover the major doctrines uh, that many churches approach and address when they put out a, a statement of faith or belief this is ours. And so if you have questions, go over it, read it. If you have questions, feel free to call me or any of our Ad Council. Uh, Rod Just is our Ad Council Chairman. Uh, Tina Haig, they're, um, they're vacationing. But uh, Tina is our lay leader. And so, uh, and I know we have other clients on the Ad Council and who else? Raise your hand, Ad Council. Yeah. Gordon, Jerry, Don, Wanda. You're on Ad Council? I've never seen you at a meeting. You've been tardy a lot. Absolutely. Uh, so just uh, just approach one of us, um, and, and if you have questions, we'd be more than happy to talk to you. All right. Any other announcements? Make your way forward if you have some. What's that? Yeah, Fourth of July celebration coming up pretty quick, isn't it? Next Sunday. Yeah, that is quick. Why do I keep thinking this is the middle of June? Does that anybody else feel that way? This should not. Next week should not be the first of July. But next Sunday is our 4th of July celebration. So that'll be exciting. And we've got a clipboard to pass around for that, for the desserts and ice creams. Of course, we've got plenty of that. All right. So clipboard, sign up for ice cream or, or a dessert. And here's the thing. If you don't have an ice cream maker, if, if you want to buy the fix in somebody else with an ice cream maker, probably will be more than happy to, to make the ice cream for you if you want to help out with the supplies and ingredients. But we'll get that started. Now, as it goes down and back and up, and 
back there. Let's make sure it comes back down this side. Some, somewhere along there it hides uh, sometimes. So uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's make sure it makes it all the way to the front on this side. It's kind of like a science experiment at this point, okay? Um, other announcements, one more. Next Sunday, because of my message and because of communion, we're going to have family Sunday, so there'll be no junior church, no children's church. Okay, just for that Sunday. They're going to be in here, and uh, I've got a message on them that on family. So, just to give you a heads up on that, parents. I've got several announcements here that were up on the podium to be read. Well, the We'll get the important one out of the way first. I found it on the way here, Amber and I did. Jesus and Moses play golf. Jesus and Moses are playing golf and they're on the 10th hole. Moses hits the ball and heads straight for a pond. Just before the ball hits the water, the pond parts and the ball rolls up onto the green. Jesus winds up and hits his one, one about to the same spot. Jesus' ball hits the water and skips across. All of a sudden, lightning flashes and a ball drops from the sky. A fish swallows it, a bird picks up the fish and drops the ball onto a turtle that walks over to the hole and drops it in. Moses turns to Jesus and says, I hate it when your dad plays. <laughs> you gotta have a morning laugh for the day. <laughs> so we have several things to be read here. Dear Only Church, thank you for praying for me to go to church camp to ta at Tabor. I had a great time. I feel my walk with the Lord grew. Love, Noah. Brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for your hospitality and welcoming us to your church as we pass forth towards Pilsen these past several years. The shade of your trees helps so much to provide and I did not know that word there. Respite. Respite. Gotcha. I would have said respile. I didn't know that word. <laughs> we can't thank you enough. We will pray for you, Jason. Dear Pastor Lee, expressing the gratitude we feel for the blessings expressed by the community and more specifically the children of the community has proven strangely difficult yet simple. We keep coming back to praise God and thank you for your efforts and those of your congregation in conducting and supporting the recently completed Vacation Bible School. God Rescue Me rang, rang through our home last, our home long past last Friday. Our four-year-old grandson still asks his eight-year-old brother, what do you do if you're sad or lonely or angry? Pray is the immediate answer. The CD containing the music of VBS, which we did play a couple songs here, was played over and over and over on a trip to Wichita to visit an exploration place. What a positive and lasting impact. A second yet still vitally important blessing of VBS was, wit was witnessed by the impressive stacks of food in the elementary gym last Friday. That children were visually help to understand that some children do not have enough to eat taught another lasting lesson about serving the, the least of these. The whopping 575 pounds of groceries and more than $400 in cash is yet another example of God rescuing those in need. The food bank shelves were a bit bare until last Friday. A final blessing for us was to see and hear so many of our children singing God's praise and shouting Bible verses during the closing assembly. Again, God bless you and thank you for your part in the magnificent week that, that was VBS. In Christ, Kathy Henderson. And last but not least, please join us for a brunch. Oh. Yeah. Brunch. <laughs> for a brunch, bridal shower, honoring Brooke Haas. There's a hat. Okay, off. Fiance of Evan Just. When? It's July 7th, which is in two weeks at 9 a.m. Where? And it's here at the church in the fellowship hall. 
and Brooke is registered at Target, Walmart, Bed and Bath and Bed Bath and Beyond, and Big Money Hardware Store. So that's all I have. All right. Bed Bath. Where is Beyond? <laughs> I always could never figure that one out. Yeah, yeah, that's the bathroom. Yeah. yeah, good to know. Good to see you all out today, though. And just in case, I want to just point out a few things that we try to do here only occasionally to just identify with our precious Lord and Savior. You'll notice that in the summertime, I wear my Jesus shoes. And today, we have our guest cojones. <laughs> Ethan Riggs, he's got his Jesus hair and beard. Between the two of us, we got Jesus covered. Woo! I like you, man. All right. Yeah. Isn't it nice to come back home? All right. How about a birthday? Anybody grow older? Mmm.
think this is my first time up here. <laughs> Please stand as we join together in the call to worship. We will read this responsibly. <coughs> we are the church that lives into God's future today. A church united across space and time. A church of many races, <laughs> languages, and ethnicities. A church that lives by the word of God, Christ that was, is now, and is still to come. The one who is seated on the throne says to us, See, I am making all things new. A new heaven and a new earth, where the home of God is among God's people. God's future is epic, and it's good news. Remember God's future, this is our story. Amen. And please remain standing as the praise team comes forward. Good morning. It is good to be back, and I would like to thank um, Jason for taking my Sunday school class and Don for doing the scripture when I was gone last week. I was with Zeke all week, and it was a good time, but it's always good to be back here as well. Um, and I'd like to add, Pastor Jeff was talking about um, the food bank. The first Sunday of every month is considered Food Bank Sunday, so if you would keep that in mind and you'd like to bring something for the food bank, you are welcome to do that, and we'll see that it gets there. Um, if you don't want to do that, you're always welcome to write a check to the food bank every first Sunday of the month to help them out. From Revelation 4, 9 through 11. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They make their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord. And by your will they were created and have their being.
the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand.
that off me first. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning asking for you to sit right next to us in these pews, to be right there with us, to put a hand on our shoulders, to let us feel your presence within the songs, within the scriptures that are read, within the messages that are said. Help us to know that through all of our struggles that we have gone through this past week, that that you've been right there with us and you're going to help us in the days ahead. And as we leave this church today, help us to remember that you are, you go with us, that you don't just remain here at church waiting for us next Sunday. We just thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you're going to do in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, come on down. Here are the next contestants. some fishermen. Go ahead. I like to fish too. So I brought some worms today. What, do you think these do you think these will these will work to go fishing? Yes. <laughs> okay, you think we could catch a fish with these? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Well anyway, I brought those. Okay, and I always like to know like where things come from. So gummy worms were invented by a German candy maker in 1922. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't come to America until 1981. <coughs> and, and really, the, yeah, the, the people that made it, the intent was to give children something fun to eat and kind of mildly shock their parents that they were eating worms. But do we think anything about it now? Not really. Because we eat gummy worms and gummy bears and, I don't know, whatever else gummy there is, right? Okay, well, today we're going to talk about how gummy worms are like discipleship. That's a big word, isn't it? So first I'm going to read a little passage in the Bible. And it's from Matthew. And it is from chapter 4, and it's verses 18 through 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. <coughs> Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father preparing their nets. 
Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boats and their father, and they followed Jesus. Okay, so <clears throat> discipleship. That's a, that's a really big word. Does anybody know what that means? What does it mean to be a disciple? Jesus called us to be fishers of men too, didn't he? So what does that mean, to be a fisher of men? To be a follower of him, right? What about this? What, I've got a question for you. What are we to fish for as Christians? Well, yeah, he, uh, for Jesus. But what else does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to be fishers of men. He says, go out and be fishers of men. What would that mean? Does it really mean he wants us to just go fishing with worms? Well, I think he had something else in mind. He wants us to go out and he wants us to tell our friends and everybody that we know about Jesus. And that's what, that's what being a disciple is. It's when we go and we tell our friends and our family and people even that we don't know about Jesus. Okay, so is someone really a true disciple of Christ if they never attempt to win a soul for Christ? That might be a really good question for your parents out there, too. That was, that kind of hit me in, in a little spot that made me really think. So when we go fishing, do we just take our fishing poles and do we cast our nets out into the backyard? Well, where do we go? We have to go to a certain spot, right? We go to a place where we know that there's fish, right? And so Jesus gave us the best example. He went to the people, didn't he? He didn't wait for people to come to him. So we as Christians, we need to go out into the world and we need to be witnesses for God. And you guys can do that just by the way that you act, by the way that you treat your friends, by the way you treat your brothers and sisters. And people are going to notice that. Your friends are going to notice. That's how we can be fishers of men, okay? All right, so Jesus said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So next time you see a little gummy worm... I want you to think about being a fisher of men, okay? And I've got a special snack for you too, but first I want you to fold your hands and we're going to pray, okay? Dear Jesus, I thank you for each one of these uh, special children that came to hear your message today. I just ask that you just help them, um, just when they see reminders um, of you, just to remember um, all the stories and all of the messages that you want them to spread and just help help us all to be fishers of men in your name we pray amen okay now the snack i have for you is something when i when you see these two because i bet a lot of you guys like these i want you to think about this message too okay and i want you to be fishers of men when you eat these goldfish okay you guys all like goldfish okay all right everybody grab one Kids, the kindergarten through fifth grade are dismissed to go down to the go down to the fellowship hall. And children, infants through four years age are dismissed to go downstairs to the nursery. If I could have our ushers come forward, we'll take up a morning offering. Please bow with me in prayer again. Oh God, we come to you at this portion of our service where we reach into our pockets and we give back to you a portion of what we've earned this past week with the labor of our hands and we just ask that you take these offerings and you multiply them 
within our hearts and within the church to just overwhelm us with what you can do and help us to have a greater faith in you and what the abilities that you have that we need to work on within our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. share some joys and concerns. Lord, we come before you now with, uh, with just thankful hearts. We realize that there is nothing that you can't do. Everything is within your realm of possibility, even what seems impossible for us. I was reminded of the song yesterday and we started singing it. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God cannot do. We believe that. Lord, we pray and ask that you, Almighty God, with your watchful eye and your caring hand and your loving heart, would in each of these situations minister in such a way that the faith of those that you're ministering to and our faith is increased, but more importantly that glory and honor are brought to your holy name, that your presence is made known in this world. And so we ask that you would minister the physical needs that have been mentioned here this morning, Lord. Those who are in critical condition with their health and physical infirmities, we ask that you would stretch forth your hand and touch them, not only as the great physician, but as a loving father. Lord, we pray and ask that you would send the rain Lord, uh, we need it for our crops, for our cattle. Uh, Lord, whether or not people realize that we need it to sustain our lives as well. 
So we ask that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out the rain upon the land. We pray too and ask that you'd open up that window spiritually and pour out your presence upon us. May revival sweep our nation and spread across the world. We live in uncertain days. Lord, we pray and ask that we would make it a priority to walk ever so close to you. Lord, we pray and ask that you would be with us throughout the rest of the service. Open up our hearts to the truth of your word. Be with our celebration next Sunday evening. Lord, may it be a time of, of just fun where the community in your church come together and your name is lifted. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. And that's a lot. A lot of times we just take those things for granted. But we realize that it's the blessing of your presence upon your children. Now we pray and ask that you would help us to walk with you throughout this next week. Those who are traveling, Lord, watch over and protect them. Those who are on vacation now, Lord, help them to be relaxed and rejuvenated, but we watch over and protect them and keep them safe. For those that are going to be traveling, whether it's across the nation, across the state, or around the world, as was mentioned, Lord, we pray and ask that you would watch over and protect them. May your mercy be upon them as they travel. Be with us as we go throughout the week and help us to be willing to share the good news of your love to those around us, as Becky talked about. Help us to be fishers of men. Lord, we thank you for your loving presence in our life. I thank you for this church, for these that are here this morning. I ask that you would bless them greatly. Draw us ever closer to you. May we have a hunger and a desire to be in your presence. Not just when we're here, but Lord, may we have a hunger and a desire to be in your word, spend time with you. Help us be shining lights in a dark and lonely world. And we'll be quick to praise you for what you do in us and through us as well as what you do for us. Now we ask that you would keep us mindful and help us to pray as you taught the disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time we have a special. Making my special comes following Veterans Day and preceding the 4th of July here. And we just feel like we want to honor God, our country, our soldiers, and our veterans that are so prevalent in our lives and so needed by each of us to protect us. And this morning I want to thank Lori and Tori for helping us get this put together and they're going to present it for us. So thank you. A nurse took the tired, anxious serviceman to the bedside. Your son is here, she said to the old man. She had to repeat the words several times before the patient's eyes opened. Heavily sedated because of the pain of his heart attack, he dimly saw the young, uniformed Marine standing outside the oxygen tent. He reached out his hand. The Marine wrapped his toughened fingers around the old man's limp ones, squeezing a message of love and encouragement. 
The nurse brought a chair so that the Marine could sit beside the bed. All through the night, the young Marine sat there in the poorly lighted ward, holding the old man's hand and offering him words of love and strength. Occasionally, the nurse suggested that the Marine move away and rest a while. He refused. Whenever the nurse came into the ward, the Marine was oblivious to her and of all the night noises of the hospital. The clanking of the oxygen tank, the laughter of the night staff members exchanging greetings, the cries and moans of the other patients. Now and then, she heard him say a few gentle words. The dying man said nothing, only held tightly to his son all through the night. Along towards the dawn, the old man died. The Marine released the now lifeless hand he had been holding and went to tell the nurse. While she did what she had to do, he waited. Finally, she returned. She started to offer words of sympathy, but the Marine interrupted her. Who was that man? he asked. The nurse was startled. He was your father, she answered. No, he wasn't, the Marine replied. I never saw him before in my life. Then why didn't you say something when I took you to him? I knew right away there had been a mistake, but I also knew he needed his son, and his son just wasn't here. When I realized that he was too sick to tell whether or not I was his son, knowing how much he needed me, I stayed. I came here tonight to find a Mr. William Gray. His son was killed in Iraq today, and I was sent to inform him. What was this gentleman's name? The nurse, with tears in her eyes, answered, Mr. William Gray. The next time someone needs you, just be there. Stay.
Please stand with me and we will join together for the reading of the scripture. The first one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, I put childish ways behind me. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. What is it that was your favorite thing as a child? What was what did you enjoy as a child? Gathering at your grandparents' home every Sunday evening. Playing with the cousins. Playing with my animals. I had a goat and a dog and a cat. Goat and a dog and a cat. Yeah. Riding horseback on my horse. Riding horseback on your horse. There you go. Playing ragtime on the piano. My brother and I would play some to see who could last. All right. Swimming at Catlin Creek. <laughs> Swimming in Catlin Creek. Anyone else? It was fun being a kid, wasn't it? Playing with friends. Most people, you folks don't know it, but I was born, uh, I didn't walk the first two and a half, three years of my life. I couldn't walk. I was in braces. So uh, I spent a lot of time alone. Uh, just my mom. That's probably why she told me I was her favorite. Told all my siblings, too. But there was, there was six years between me and my brother. And so he was off running, playing with his friends. Uh, I was sat on the floor uh, in braces, couldn't walk, had to be carried everywhere. Uh, I could drag myself, my mother said. She goes, you got really good at the army crawl, you know. Um, but I had had a condition within my legs where my feet were turned out so far that I, the muscles uh, wouldn't allow my feet to be turned in. So I had to wear braces. So I learned to play by myself as a young child. Uh, and, and I enjoyed that. I had friends. I did all the things you did. We did When I was able to walk and run and do the things, uh, you know, I was doing all kinds of things. Uh, I was playing in the barn. I was swinging on the ropes. Uh, and from my mom's perspective, that was uh, that was a miracle for for her. She, the doctor told her, she he goes, you, you got him in just in time, you know. Because she goes, he goes, uh, eventually that would have crippled him uh, because there's no way we. He's he's young enough now we can we can get it fixed. But so I learned to play by myself. Uh, and I, I did that. I developed an imagination. Um, and it was a good thing. Uh, it helped me to think. But there were times when you just liked to run and with your friends. We built hay forts in the barn. Uh, I know it's probably not politically correct, but, you know, we had the BB gun fights. 
steel trash can lids really protect you. They're, they're like a shield. And uh, it, it had a kick can. We played, and we had a big barnyard, and we could set up a softball. It was big enough to play softball in, uh, or baseball. Uh, had a pond out when I was a kid. We had a pond out back of the uh, barn, a little pond, and it would freeze over. And so we go uh, ice skating or play hockey and uh, hit each other with sticks and that kind of stuff. That was always fun. Uh, there's it's, there are things that you just enjoyed about being a kid. You know, I can remember my mom hearing her. Where are my clothespins? Because me and my brother, we loved matchbox cars, and we would take her clothespins and create roads throughout our bedroom. And we had little construction trucks, and she'd come in and her clothespins would be spread over two rooms. And she'd say, I need to hang up clothes. Uh, just all those kind of things. You think about them. Spending time with cousins and playing with them over at relative's house. We went every Friday to my Uncle Fred and Aunt Donna's place. And uh, there, all the, everybody was there. Cousins and friends. It was an unspoken place on Friday night. That's where you went. Uh, and uh, So we had a lot of memories. Paul writes and says... When I was a child, I acted as a child. How difficult was it for you to make that transition to growing up and being an adult? Well, is there any one thing or time or place that stands out in your mind where you say, okay, I'm an adult now? Start driving. Start driving. That's not everybody's. I mean... What's that? When, I enlisted. when you enlisted. First job. First job, yeah. For a lot of people, that first job. How old was you when you got your first job? I mean, your first uh, your first job with with. I mean, I know a lot of us started working, you know, mowing lawns and that when we were younger, but. What about your first job with a pay stub where the government took their share? I was uh, about 14 and a half, 15. I, I had to, my mom had to write a letter to the state getting permission to do that. But it, it was because my dad had had a stroke and, and I went to a private school. So I paid my own way. I wanted a job, paid my own way. And so she had to send a letter and get permission for the state to allow me. And I was only supposed to be able to work so many hours a week, but the employer really never recognized that. So, um, but it, yeah, most of us started that. It's there's that point in our mind when we say, "That's when I grew up." At least we think we grew up. There are some things that are difficult, though, to leave behind in childhood, aren't they? Look at what Paul writes, and he gives this description when he talks about the transition from being a, a new believer, a child, if you will, a toddler in Christ, and an adult believer. He gives all these, in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am becoming a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. There is a theme here, or a, a rite of passage, if you will, or a sign of making that transition from being the immature child of God to being the mature believer. In Paul's mind. That's what he's writing about. Because he says, if you go on and read that, and I read this a lot of times 
during uh, wedding ceremonies. It's a favorite of uh, wedding ceremonies. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, in verse 4 of chapter 13, this is what he goes on to say. Love suffers long, or love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in sin or iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But all the things, he lists a few things that he mentioned in the previous verses that I started with. Notice what he says. He says, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come then that which is in part will be done away with. Then we get to our verse, our key verse. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul uses this verse as an illustration of a transition, and he uses the, the illustration of childhood. You might think it a little strange. Wives, if you came in one day and saw your husbands down on the floor with no grandchildren around, obviously, playing with their little soldiers. Going, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> Taking little foil balls and using them as cannons. <laughs> You'd say, hmm. Maybe I need to call somebody. <laughs> You'd even think it was strange if your wife came in, guys. Well, you might not think it's strange, but uh, if your wife came in and said, let's go play hide and seek. There may be some of you say, all right, honey, I've been, I've been waiting for that. If those words come out of your mouth for a long time. I don't know, but I'm talking hide and seek as in childhood. You go run and find each other. And don't get me wrong. I, when I do premarital counseling, I tell uh, couples all the time, adults still have to play. You have to keep a little bit of your childhood within you. I believe that. But not the childish things. You can still act young. That doesn't mean you have to be childish. You know, and so Paul's using this as an illustration. And, and he uses it as love. And here is the thing. He's not just talking, he's not talking about romantic love. He's not talking of, even about necessarily brotherly love, although brotherly love and romantic love can be folded right into the kind of love he's talking about. He is talking about the self-denying love of Jesus Christ. Agape love. He is talking about that kind of love. Because that is the love. When you read, now listen, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll preface it with this. When you read in the Scriptures and it uses the word perfect, Perfect, they translated, it really means complete. It's, it's complete. So when Paul writes and says, when that which is perfect or that which is complete arrives or comes to be or comes to bear, all that which is not complete, that is in part, will then be understood of how it folds into God's plan. So prophecies and tongues and those kind of things. He, he's talking spiritual things, but he's using... Uh, remember, he, uh, I always tell you every once in a while, I say for everything in the natural, there's a supernatural correlation. 
So Paul's using a natural illustration of a childhood because everybody had, everybody was a kid. I know it's hard to believe sometimes. We look at people. You ever known those people and seen them, encountered them? They look like they've sucked on uh, sour lemons all their life, and you think they were never young. They came out of their mama's womb old and cranky. I mean, we've, you've encountered those people. But in the reality, they, they were young. They were a child. They acted childish. What are some childish traits that we learn not to appreciate? Temper tantrums. Oh, did any of you have, maybe some of you even did it. You got upset with your parents and you marched to your room. Anybody do that? Not you. Y'all, you're saints. <laughs> huh? Or throw something? Anybody here still throw something every now and then? Come on. I confess. I beat the living daylights out of the front quarter panel of a car one time. And if I'd have had the automotive engineer that designed that engine, I'd have beat the car out of him. <laughs> Who puts the last spark plug on a slant six engine where you can't get it? <laughs> you get all the others. You get the five other spark plugs out. You get to that last one. They all come out real quick. You get to that last one. You gotta pull the engine almost. I still never forget the look on my wife's face when she walked out in the garage and I was beating that quarter panel. I mean, there were paint chips flying everywhere and I was just mad. Some of you may think ill of me, that's okay, I can live with that, Jesus forgave me. But I beat that quarter panel and she was standing there and I stopped and she was behind me and I, she, her eyes were like that. And she was speechless. And I turned and said, oh, hi, honey. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where I could see she was thinking, I need to call somebody right away. Because he's nuts. I didn't take it out on her. I didn't even take it out on the cat or the dog. That tells you how much God worked in my life. I didn't take it out on anybody. I took it out on a thing. Be it right or wrong, whatever you think of me, that's what happened. I was 24 years old. 25, I think. I do remember that. I remember a lot of things that happened. You and I... We throw temper tantrums. What else? What's some other childish behavior that we don't like? Pouting. Oh. Was anybody here a powder? How about whiners? I, my grandson, Ivan, he's got this response to everything. Grandpa, can I do this? No. Aw. I turned him down just to hear him do that. Because <laughs> it's very exaggerated, isn't it, Sean? Aw. And you kind of... Well, yeah, they got brown Yeah. What other kind of childish behavior? Teasing. Teasing. <laughs> Some things you just can't give up. That is what gets you through life sometimes. Teasing, sarcasm. What about when teenagers learn to be sarcastic? Isn't that like the first day of hell? <laughs> there are all these things that that 
we can think of that are childish that we have to give up if we're going to make it through. We, and sometimes they're the tough things to give up. Those behaviors. It's easy to give up your toys, your bikes, when it, skateboarding. I was I, When I skateboarded, it was a board with steel wheels that were that close together. And if you could stand on it, people thought you were fantastic. Then they came out with these mag wheels and I was way, that was way after I learned to skateboard. I learned to skateboard on those steel wheels and you hit a, a just a little rock, a chip, and it threw you. I had more scrapes and bruises. I probably had my first concussion but no one knew skateboarding. Those things are easy to give up. Sometimes the tougher things to give up are the pouting, the temper tantrum, the, the teasing, the sarcasm. Sometimes the things that we take and we adopt into our own lives from the adults around us from when we were growing up are the same things that they had a difficult time giving up. So maybe your parents or your older siblings, as they grew up, they still held on to the things that were childish. Paul goes on to tell us that when we understand the complete nature of the work of Christ in us and that nature is love. What does John write in his first epistle? He writes and he says this, God is... Oh, that was weak. God is love. So when you read 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about love. He's talking about God. The completion or the allowance of God to work in our lives in complete fashion. Sometimes that's difficult for us, isn't it? So God is not rude. God is not unloving. God is patient. God is kind. God doesn't seek His own purposes. That is evidenced at Jesus Christ on the cross. God became man, John writes, in his first chapter of the Gospel. What's he say? And the truth became flesh and dwelt among us. God came down from heaven and took on our form and He died so that you and I could be completed through His presence at work in our life. Now that is the miraculous thing. So how do we make this transition from being a, a, a child, a little child of God, we're all children of God, doesn't matter... I mean, you look at Eugene over here. He's got his child sitting in front of him. Now, Rod's a grown man. Makes decisions all on his own. Wears long pants, everything. <laughs> he is a man. But he still, in the eyes of his father, is his child. I have four children. They will always be my children. Doesn't matter. If I live to be a hundred and they live to be, uh, well, not quite that old, but doesn't matter what age they are, they're still your child. But what I'm talking about is the adjective description of your children. Childish. Childish. When God looks at us, what does He see when He looks at your life and mine? Does He see a childish child of His? Or does he see a maturing child who is growing in the grace and the knowledge of his presence? You see, 
this series has been about, even though the, the, we, they've been different titles, they've all been the same thing. How do you spell success? In the Christian life, it's not just coming to church. It's not just singing songs. It's not just carrying your Bible. It is when you and I have a hunger and a thirst to be more like Jesus. <coughs> and so when, when you get up and you open up the Word of God in the morning, it is not just like, it's not supposed to be like what you do when you get up in the morning after you do all of your morning constitutional things and you brush your teeth, comb your hair, shave, or whatever it is you do. And ladies, you do your hair, throw the makeup on, and then you come out and you just kind of go, oh, I'm kind of hungry. I think I want something to eat. And you open up the cupboard and you go, do I want cereal? Do I want yogurt? Do I want a piece of toast with some sugar on it? I don't know. That is not what we're supposed to approach the Word of God like. It's not just supposed to be, well, we got to do this because, well, you know. My mom used to tell me, eat your, eat your breakfast. Most important meal of the day. When I was going to school, always had breakfast. Always. She said it's the most important meal of the day. I guess lunch was the second most important meal because she packed it in a grocery sack that looked like Jethro Bodine going to school. <laughs> she usually packed me three or four sandwiches and a big bag of chips and a ho-ho or a ding-dong or a little Debbie peanut butter bar. And then if we had leftover cold chicken, she'd throw that in. I could feed three or four people at my lunch table. I'm not kidding. That's not an exaggeration. It was back when grocery sacks weren't plastic, they were paper. She packed my lunch in a paper grocery bag, not a little lunch bag. Food was important to my mother. She thought it was important for me to feed my body. It is important, Jeff, that you feed your body. It is more important that you and I feed our spirit with the things that will nurture and help us to grow to become big people in Jesus. That is our goal. Paul writes in Romans chapters 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, for this is your reasonable act of worship. I memorize in King James, by the way. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world or the thinking of this world, but be renewed by the transformation of your mind. It goes back to our learning triad. The way we think is the beliefs that we adopt. The beliefs that we adopt get acted out by our everyday behavior. And so, the more we allow ourselves to be transformed and to grow up in Christ Jesus, the more we feed our, our, our nurturing spirit with the things that are going to help us grow to be more like Christ, the more we begin to believe. You, I tell you what, I'm going to... I'm gonna, getting myself in trouble this morning just before I close. The reason that this is being called into question is because they are not reading it. You read this like it is more important than your breakfast cereal or your scrambled eggs and bacon in the morning. When this becomes the primary thing that you realize it's going to transform my life. This is going to make me grow up in my spiritual being. That someday when people look at me, they will see Jesus before they see the childish things that were a part of my life. Before they understand anything else, they will see Jesus. 
There was used to be a great commercial on TV. Some of you are probably saying, how can this be great? But back in the 70s, they had this really great lighthearted music. And you saw this father and his son. And the father was, was uh, uh, washing his car. And here the, he's got that mitt on and he's washing the car. Here's a little boy. His son comes up and he washing the car. And then the next thing you know, dad's doing some yard work. And here the boy is following along with dad and doing the same kind of yard work. And then dad sits down underneath the tree. And this is back when you could advertise cigarettes on television. And he pulls out a pack of cigarettes and he... he taps one out and he puts one in his mouth and, he, and the boy's sitting, you guys remember this commercial, don't you? The boy's sitting underneath the tree next to his dad and his dad sets his pack of cigarettes down there and the boy, little boy, picks up the cigarette and he starts to pull one out. And the voiceover comes up and says, like father, like son. That stayed with me forever. Now, uh, this is an anti-smoking message. If you smoke, that's between you and God. You've heard me say many a times, you can smoke and go to heaven. You'll just smell like you've been in hell. I'm okay with that. <laughs> that is not the issue. The issue is the things that we do, other people are watching. The way you and I respond, I have 14 grandchildren, the way I treat my wife, they look at now. Because my children looked at the way I treated my wife when they were growing up. The things that are important to us. I said no to my children a lot of times. You know why? Because it was Sunday. My son invited to try and go on a traveling basketball team. When do they travel? All summer long on Saturday and Sunday. I said, hey, sorry, can't do it. Well, what, what do you mean? I said, there's something more important that he needs to be doing on Sunday. Now, that's just me. I am not holding... That was just my conviction. Because I knew my son was never going to be a pro basketball player. He was never going to go on a college, college scholarship and play basketball somewhere. Why would I want him to miss out on this? This! The people of the church, the people of God. Why would I want him not to experience the people of God, the teaching of God's Word, the authority of God's Word, the importance of church, the, the importance of, of worship? Why would I want him to miss out on that to dribble a ball up and down the court? Now, that's coming from a basketball player in high school. All conference. But that, that, I never became, I never went to college to play basketball. I never had the dream, I never had the skill to be a professional basketball player. No one was going to pay me to play basketball. There were people who were probably willing to pay me to quit <laughs> playing basketball, but not to play. You see, it's about priorities. If we're going to be successful followers of Jesus Christ, if you want to be a successful Christian, if you want to be a big person in Jesus, you've got to make the tough calls sometimes. You've got to give up the toys. You've got to give up the childish behavior. And you've got to be a big person in Jesus. Stand up. Lord, I pray and ask that you would help us. I know I get myself in trouble a lot. But we are living in a world where whole churches, whole denominations, not just ours either, but denominations are battling the issue of the authority of the Word of God. Where your doctrines, your teachings, the things that you inspired men in their hearts to write down, men who weren't smart enough to 
do it on their own. But you inspired them with these words and with these thoughts. They are yours. Lord, we pray and ask that You would help us to grow in the knowledge of Your Word. To grow in truth. All truth is from You. You are the truth. You Yourself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Me. Lord, help us to be people who put away the childish things. And the childish things are about what we want, what we want to do. Help us to grow up to be big people in Your presence. To be, we'll always be Your children in Your eyes. But help us to mature and to grow that we might be able to change the world and to be examples to the next generation that follows behind us. Lord, let us not waver in well-doing and living and pursuing Your righteousness. Help us to be people who make the transition from being small children being grown up in you and help us to bring a generation behind us to see the importance of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Last song. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. upon you.